one of our values at UCM is holistic worship. And that's not just a value to poke to the idea of, hey, we worship God with our minds and our bodies and our spirits. And, you know, we have to pay attention to our relationships and our environments. It's not, not just meant to talk about how we worship God, but also, um, uh, well, it is the, how we worship God, but how we worship God with everything that we are, including uh, what is in front of us, the work in front of us. Um, the work in front of you guys right now is you are students and you have that work in front of you. Some of you are actually on co-ops, so you do have real jobs too. Um, but many of us are thinking about that future and what, um, what we will do with our vocational lives. So we are setting aside, setting aside this month to think about the topic of work. And I think as Christians, not only do we long to do work that matters, but we wanna do work that matters to God. And um, some of the questions that I think we need to be posing, some of the questions we need to be asking is, how can God reveal himself to us through our work? Um, so how does like our work, how does it matter? How does it matter to God? Can he reveal himself to us through it? And also, can he reveal himself to others through the work that we do? Um, so we're going to be thinking about that topic over this month. Last night, uh, last night, last week, um, we started this series and I talked a bit about the element, the story element of creation and how that, how God gave us good work to do uh, from the beginning. Uh, this week, we're going to be stepping into kind of chapter two of the grand narrative of thinking about fall and sin and how sin has affected our work. Um, so I wanted to uh, invite um, Mr. Reverend Dr. Todd Statham. Um, he's going to share with us tonight, and he's also brought along a special guest um, to share and give us insight into how he's working those two questions out in his own vocation. So over to you, Todd. Yeah, thanks, James, and thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure for me to connect with, uh, with UCM, and when I drop in, I, I just enjoy seeing your faces on your little screens, uh, and I look forward to seeing some of you guys next year in person. And what a great topic, work. Work, this high and holy calling, vocation. Like Pastor James said last week, God made the world good, and he, he calls us as his image bearers to work the world so that it flourishes. Now, this call to work to bear God's image takes place in a world that's made by God, but it's fallen away from God. And that fundamentally affects how we should think about work, including our studies. And like Pastor James has said, every job is a parable. In other words, it reveals something, a story. It tells a story. I agree. So if every job is a parable, what is it a parable of? Whose story is it telling? Because make no doubt, our job, our work, will tell a story, whether we realize it or not. Is our, par is our job a, a parable of the kingdom of God, or does it reveal a different kingdom? Because while we believe as Christians that we live in a world and, and work in a world that God created good, it is, it is a world that is, that is broken. It's been distorted by sin and evil. It's a world that the Bible teaches us is, is fallen. And that's what I want to talk about this evening really quickly, just in 10 minutes. The world is fallen and what that means for our work. And as I share a couple of thoughts, um, just keep in mind this question I already asked. If every job is a parable, is your job telling the story of the kingdom of God? Or is it revealing a kingdom of darkness? And when I, when I use that phrase, I'm not, being, I'm not being melodramatic. That's actually the phrase that Paul in the New Testament uses to describe our world, a dominion of darkness. Now, when we talk about the world as fallen or the fall, as the church traditionally has called it, it's, uh, it's a big topic. And I find it's good to get some help in thinking this out because it's complex. Now, for thinking about the fall and how, how sin has distorted God's good world, I often turn to someone named Calvin for help. That's John Calvin. He's one of the great theologians 
of the Christian church, you know he's great because of the size of his beard. But I'm not talking about this Calvin. When I'm thinking about the fall, I turn to this Calvin. Do you know Calvin and Hobbes? I think this is just one of the, the most philosophically astute comics that is out there. Um, Calvin and his imaginary tiger Hobbes. My daughter and I get up early, earliest in the family on Saturday mornings. And, and lately we've been reading Calvin and Hobbes comic books while we eat breakfast together, which is great. So look at this sequence. Calvin and his tiger Hobbes are sledding down the hill. They're careening down the hill. Um, and they're having a very typical discussion for each other with each other. It's, it's a discussion about the human condition. Calvin asks Hobbes, do you think human nature is good or evil? I mean, are people basically good or basically evil? And uh, Hobbes comes up with a third option at the very end. He chooses crazy maybe as, a, as an option. So, you know, he doesn't answer the question, but the great thing about this comic series is that throughout the book, the answer is very clear. Is human nature good? or evil? The answer is clear when we look at Calvin. There's something, there's something wrong with us. There's something dark inside us, deeply wrong. There's a darkness that can twist us and our work, our image bearing, all our all our creativity and industry that Jaco de Vin talked about last week can be twisted into something that's ugly, violent, it's oppressive, and self-serving. Every job is a parable. But whose story does it tell? I found out last week when I was listening in that some of you have been studying the book of Genesis this semester or this year in, in your core groups, which is, which is great. And if you have been, you're familiar with, uh, with a key story, Genesis 3, the story of when Adam and Eve, our first parents, eat of a forbidden fruit in this primeval garden and disobey God. If you don't know this story, uh, I just encourage you to read it. Um, it's, a, it's a foundational story for thinking about what it means to be human and for why our world feels broken. It's a story that's heavily symbolic. There's a, a garden and a naked woman and a naked man and fruit and a tree and a serpent. And the story isn't meant to explain where evil, come from, e evil comes from or, or explain why we are alienated from God as much as just describe the fact of it that it is so, that God's good world is spoiled and that we've fallen away from our creator and everything has been distorted in some way. So the rest of the, of the big story of the Bible flows from this story and it's tense with conflict between good and evil, life and death, between God and the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil. And the biblical story is rife with drama between grace and the world's resistance to God. And this is a drama that plays out in, in the cosmic realms, in history, and of course, in every single heart, like Jesus himself teaches us here in this passage from Luke. It's out of the heart that we do and we act. Indeed, where do our hearts incline? Again, the great thinker Calvin gives us some, some direction here. Faced with an epic ethical dilemma, an enormous pile of snowballs, a helpless neighbor, neighbor girl, will he pelt her with snowballs? The final sequence or the final episode, of course, he says, goodness as usual, hardly puts up a fight. I think a better description of the human condition you probably can't find in any philosopher or theologian. So what's remarkable about the biblical story is that God puts up a fight for the world. He doesn't turn his back on us. 
after the fall, in fact, he gets his hands dirty and he gets to work to redeem and restore all that was lost to him. He does this through Jesus Christ primarily. And in fact, he, he creates a people who will work with him in this task. And, you know, spoiler alert, that's us. Uh, and in the next weeks, it, it looks like we're going to be hearing more about redemption and reconciliation, these other two great chapters in the biblical story that follow creation and fall. So I don't want to say too much about that, other than to press the point that God sets us free from sin and delivers us from death through Christ, all this for life, for righteousness, for justice. In other words, we're saved to be called back into a world that is fallen and broken and wounded. So our calling to our studies, to a job, to work, is a calling to studies and a job and work in a world that is resolutely saying no to God, but to which God says yes in Jesus Christ and yes in his Holy Spirit. And this really needs to shape the way we think about work and why we study what we study. To, I guess to make this clear or try to make this clear as a kind of closing thought, um, I'm going to refer to another, another great Christian thinker, um, a French philosopher named Jacques Ellul. And unfortunately, there's no comic strip to accompany Jacques Ellul, at least none that I know of. Um, but Jacques Ellul writes provocatively about the human condition and our world has fallen in so many ways in studies on propaganda and technology and I'm going to reference one particular book he writes on the presence of the presence of the kingdom in the modern world and he writes very provocatively the world carries the weight of sin and is the domain of satan who is leading it away from god and thus toward death you know, really strong words and he's making the point that the world is in rebellion against god and because of that, it's dying, because it has fallen away from the Lord of life. And then he adds, it's, it's not our job to build the city of God, to raise up an order of God within this world, while remaining unconcerned with its tendencies and suicide. This is a sharp point he's making, because a lot of Christians do exactly this. We're encouraged or we're tempted to make a kind of little happy city of, of safe spirituality where we can stay warm and cozy and worshipy but from inside this church from inside this city we don't see the world suicide right outside our doors but then Alulis insists our job is to place ourselves at the very point where this will to suicide is active in its present form and to see how God's will to preservation can operate there in the given situation. This is just a remarkable sentence. To paraphrase him, God calls you and me to work at the very point where his redemption meets the world's suicide. So God has made us with special gifts, talents, and interests and skills for this purpose. This is our vocation. This is the parable that we want our jobs to tell. So we can't emphasize enough the, the gravity of a world that is willing its own death. This is the world in which we live. This is the world in which God calls us to work. But we can't emphasize strongly enough at the same time, the grace of God who wills this world to live and who places you and me at that very point where the wills collide. what exactly this calling, this vocation looks like in our fallen world is something that's really wide open. And uh, if, you, if you're wanting to discern further about this, I just encourage you to talk to Pastor James, to Pastor Rena, or to me um, about what it might look like to pursue work that is a parable of beauty in the midst of ugliness, of, of life in the midst of death, of truth in the midst of deceit, justice in the midst of oppression. And I hope in the coming weeks we'll hear 
we'll hear stories from our guests uh, that might make this a little bit more concrete, just like we heard last week, a story that made it concrete. And maybe now, as we turn to talk to, uh, to Professor Jasper, um, this will become a little bit concrete for us too. So let me transition over to talk to Dennis. Dennis, welcome. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, looks okay. good. Good. Well, I'm not going to introduce you because I want you to introduce yourself. Um, okay. So let me just begin with this really basic cluster of questions like, where are you from? Where's, uh, <laughs> where's your journey taken you? And what does your job look like now on campus? Sure. Thanks, uh, Todd. And, and thank you, everyone, for having me here today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and, uh, you know, shout out to a few people that I know out there. And, and thank you, Stephanie. It's nice to hear your testimony today. And we both hail from Mission Creek Alliance. And so it's nice to see um, it's nice to see people from your home church out there doing and learning and growing and experiencing God in awesome ways. So thank you, Stephanie, for sharing today. Uh, OK, briefly, I, how, do, how do you tell about yourself in like two minutes? Um, so quickly, here's my roles, who I am. First off, I am a child of God and I am a citizen of his kingdom. And that is something that is very, very profound and, and powerful that I don't even think I can fully comprehend. I'm a son. Um, my parents brought me to Kelowna when I was like nine months old. And uh, that was way back in the 70s. And I uh, have been in Kelowna for the most part, uh, the rest of my existence here so far. Uh, I've dabbled in a few other places, but I know paradise when I see it. Um, my parents uh, remain here, um, and uh, I remain uh, in in good relationship with them, and and, and I really appreciate them. Uh, I am a husband. I met my wife 21 years ago, um, and we have uh, we're we're in our 20th year of marriage. So I guess it's been 22 years. Um, we're in our 20th year of marriage, and uh, she was born in Kelowna, and so uh, her parents as well also live here, and so I have been blessed with two sets of amazing uh, parents uh, that have uh, absolutely fed into my life, um, and uh, I am a father. I have three children. Um, my oldest son, Isaac, is 17. Uh, I have... Um, <laughs> And uh, I can see, yep. I some, lo some love in the chat there. Totally, I'm happy with yeah. that. Yeah, it's really good to see you too, Chelsea. Um, uh, so sorry, my oldest son, or my only son, Isaac is 17. My daughter, Serena is 15. And my daughter, Etana is 12 and a half, um, but acts like she's like 18. Um, and uh, so I am a father uh, and just love the absolute stress and hair pulling existence of being a father that is. Um, and if you really want to know what failure in life looks like, try to be a parent. Uh, and because uh, you always feel like you've messed up. That's what you sweat about on the pillow at night is what did I do to mess up their lives today? Um, <laughs> and how did we cover it up? Quick, how did we do it? Uh, and then to get to the part that you guys are probably more interested in is I am also a nurse. Uh, that is uh, my calling, my vocation is a nurse. I, I've been a nurse since 2000. Um, and my field uh, that I have focused on in my career is mental health. Uh, I have spent uh, 13 years working at the acute mental health uh, unit at Kelowna General Hospital. Um, and I have spent uh, the last 11 years um, I know the math doesn't add up. There was some overlap there. Uh, be, uh, we're in my latest role, which is a teacher slash professor uh, at, in the School of Nursing at UBC Okanagan. Um, what a treat that has been. Uh, what does that look like? That means that I work with uh, keen and, and wonderful minds of people who want to enter into, uh, uh, in my opinion, a noble profession, a noble profession, but a very difficult profession. Um, and uh, try to help them learn the skills that they need to uh, to go out there and and care for our population when they're struggling, when they're sick, when they're ill, when they're weak, when they're um, vulnerable. And how do we, you know, bring about health and healing in them? Okay, how was that? That was quick. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> 
Yeah, you you speak very quickly. Good for you. A lot faster than I do. So now we know why your your beard is gray because you have three kids. But I, I want to pick away at one thing you said, um, or one part of your story. You know what what made you decide to be a nurse, and particularly yeah. what made you decide to focus on mental health. Wow. Yeah. Uh, those answers really only come in hindsight, right? Uh, I I can't really. The, the, the monumental amount of decisions and, and happenstances and and God moments that lead you to those places, I don't think I can fully suss out. But I grew up uh, struggling with asthma. I spent a lot of time as a kid in the hospital uh, and struggling with medication and inhaler, inhalers. Uh, definitely had some very scary health situations that my parents didn't think I was going to make it. Um, that changes you, I think, foundationally when you start to realize that um, life is fragile and as a kid, you shouldn't be figuring that out. And uh, I think that probably had a big influence on why I went into the healthcare field. Um, because I saw the value in it, it, it saved me, and I'm healthy. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to do something like that in my life, something of meaning and value so that others could do that. Um, I didn't plan on going into mental health when I went into nursing at all. Um, that I didn't even really know it existed, essentially. Uh, until I was in school, um, but I just I, through my training and through my experiences, it, it qu pretty quickly became evident that I have a, a gift for working with people struggling with mental health, and that I had a heart and a desire to work with people who are struggling, and uh, and it it became something more than just the job that I did for a paycheck. It became something that I really wanted to be good at, I guess. Um, and I saw that part of nursing as something I really wanted to sink into and be good at. I don't know. That's, That's one of the many paths that you could think of that led me to where I am. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a great, a great testimony to how God, how God slowly and quietly, but surely pulled you into uh, a particular place where the world is broken. And, uh, Kicking and screaming even, sometimes too. Yeah. But even your desire for excellence too, like this is something that I think all of us who are studying um, are concerned with excellence. Like it's it's not incompatible with following our vocation. We want to be the best we can be. Very cool. And it helps you redefine that too. Like I wouldn't say that me being the best means I'm the smartest or that I have the best answers or that I'm being the best means that I'm making a difference in someone's life that they felt when they were with me that they meant someone they meant something to someone else um no matter where they're at um yeah especially with mental health there's so much stigma and there's so much struggle and psychological distress that people are going through when they're vulnerable and and suffering from mental illness that um, it can feel very lonely and scary uh, and you can feel dirty and gross and unwanted and unloved. And to have somebody come in and just say, hey, you deserve to get healthy. And I want to be somebody in that journey for you. What, do we, what, what does that look like, I guess? Uh, um, how do you put it? Um, I guess excellence. Is the, it's a different definition for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, re you redefined excellence for me in... In, in terms of the gospel. Beautiful. So uh, just a, a final question, because we're running out of time. Um, yeah. I guess I'll, I'll try to squeeze two questions, this final question, and cheat a bit. Um, <laughs> so you've been doing this for over a decade on campus. You've been a nurse for, all, for over 20 years. Um, through all that time, in your walk, in your vocational walk, what have you learned about God? And how do you, how do you think you've imaged God for others? Yeah. Good Double whammy. Question. Good questions. Um, the second one, how do I, how have I imaged God? Uh, I really feel very inadequate to answer that. I feel like you need to go and talk to others. Um, how, I, you're, you're your own blind spot. Uh, how do I, I don't, uh, I'll, I'll see what I can pull out of that one. Um, but um, what has God revealed to you about himself? Oh my God, how much he loves people uh, and how much he just, doesn't want suffering uh, and that he is oh, he's willing to do whatever it takes to do that because he calls us to do that and and if we have that desire to step in and, and roll up our sleeves and 
as you said so provocatively uh, with your um, with the philosopher about uh, using such powerful, strong language as humanity and their and their there's a desire for suicide. I've worked with people who are in that place, who have 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 been there, who have are struggling with that threshold of suicide, or have or who have crossed that threshold, uh, and are are trying to put the pieces of their life back together. Um, that has been faced to me, and I've been face to face with hundreds and hundreds of people who have been there. And I think what has what God has shown me is that He is He, he is there with them. He never left them on that that metaphorical cliff. Um, as they were enacting whatever it was that they were struggling with, he was there. He saw it all and he was, and he desperately wants people well. And I think the desire for us to want to reach into other people's lives and to help them to, to find health and healing, to find purpose and meaning, to find value, um, those are God's desires. He, 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 he wants that. And I guess we become his arms and his, and his, and his hands and his, his legs and his work ethic uh, as we interact with people. Um, because if he did it, he would overwhelm the world and we would just be in awe of him. Uh, and he wants us to freely choose him. And so he, he, he gave us the horrible task of having fallen, gross, inappropriate people um, <laughs> do his incredibly gifted work for him. Um, and that's a humbling place to be. Um, but I, I have, faced that in my career and 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 it's overwhelming how much he loves people and how much he doesn't desire the fallen world that we live in and and the illness and sickness and vulnerability and and horrible things that we do to each other and the horrible things that just happen in this world that is not his plan for us at all uh, and the image of god i don't know um just being being his voice being his hands being his feet um, being that person there when they're struggling uh, or a student is wanting to, to capture that flame and go out and, and be a nurse and, and provide that care. Um, you, that, that is, that is God. That is how we portray his values and his desire for us uh, and for this world. I think that's the image is that he, he's there. He, he does, he's working in the trenches. He's, he's with us. Oh, well, thanks, Dennis. I, uh, I, I think just since you began speaking, I had such a clear image of, of, of your work and what it's like to be an image bearer. Um, so thank you for sharing from the heart and so, so articulately about, um, about your calling, your vocation, and, uh, and inspiring us to think about our lives in terms of being God's, God's hands and feed in the world. Um, just wonder as a kind of last, we've got two minutes left. Um, just throw a, an unscripted question at you. If you have any, any, any sense or, or, or any advice for, for students, most of these students here are undergraduates. A lot of them are undecided. They're kind of, I don't want to say they're drifting. They're, uh, they have lots of, they have a wide horizon with lots of options. Um, it sometimes feels like you can be drifting, but any any just kind of closing words of advice from from a from a professor, yeah. from a from a professional, from a father, uh, for these students. God God's called you to something. You're here for a reason. You're at UBCO for a reason. Um, you you've got these talents and these gifts for a reason. Um, none of it is a chance. He is designed you uniquely and placed you so uniquely and perfectly in the world. All you need to do is all you need to do is embrace it. Um, and Todd totally cheated with this and, and brought in a nurse to talk to you today. That's so obviously a noble profession <laughs> in terms of of helping people out because it's literally the definition of that of, of going out and helping people. Um, but if you're you know doing computer science degree and you're gonna you're you're really excited about data collection and or if you're going to uh, you know work on structural engineering. And you don't even think you'll talk to people for large periods of time. Uh, that is inconsequential. There's there's ways that God is going to speak such beautiful music in you into this world, um, whether it's through your colleagues or through the works of your hands or the labors of your efforts in in, in every day. 
Um, and some days it won't feel like that. Oh, some days it'll just feel like it's a grind and your boss is a toxic, horrible human that you just want to see horribly mistreated. And he's, he just needs to he, he, he know that you are there for a reason. And as you're moving into your finals, know that God has put you here for a reason and, and that you will, <laughs> you will get through this. Um, because uh, there is a purpose there. And that's, that's, I think, the trick that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. But I've, I've, you know, every decade you put on your life, my gosh, the amount of stuff you pick up um, in, in terms of learning. Uh, it's less about the doing and it's more about the being. I, I'm in my 20s and I spent a lot of time doing a lot of things in the church and I value that and it was a really good thing and for all of you that are super connected and doing things do it I'm not saying don't um, but God more than anything desires for you to be with him and to be in a relationship with him and the people around um, the doing is good because it might help you get your mind body and your heart aligned to him but that gets you to the place where you're being with him and I'm still figuring that one out. And if you guys have any answers, please let me know because <laughs> it's a daily grind, obviously, even just to do, just to do that. But every decade, I just sort of like, yeah, I guess that makes more sense. He wants us to be. Uh, and he desires relationship more than anything. Thanks so much, Dennis. Everyone listening in, um, do you just realize we've got a prof on our hands who's super humble? Like that's that's awesome. Um, someone who hasn't, someone who admits he hasn't got it all figured out. Very cool. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, definitely not. Yeah. So thanks, thank you very much, Dennis, for for sharing from the heart and for giving us such an inspiring and very concrete and practical vision of um, of what it's like for you to bear God's image and to have a job that's a parable of the kingdom of God. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah.